Hello, friends. Yesterday was uh, International Women's Day. So we had a celebration at our university. That's why I got delayed. That's why I, cancel, I had to cancel the class last minute. Happy Women's Day to everyone who is watching this. And um, today I chose a topic where we have to uh, use these eutrotonics very judiciously so that we can prevent maternal deaths. This is one of the contributions that all of us can give and um, save the mothers and save women. So I think this is a very, very important topic, not only for exams, but also lifetime. I remember very well Dr. Padma Rao used to say, Dr. Padma Rao, uh, in case you don't know, was the one who started the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Manipal, KMC, and she was the HOD for nearly 30 years. And she used to say postpartum hemorrhage is not only a life-saving topic for the lady, it's a life-saving topic for the postgraduates. It's a life-saving topic for the undergraduates. She, I remember clearly telling, if a student is not answering anything and if the student can answer postpartum hemorrhage nicely, you must pass the student. So that's why I thought this is a very, very important topic and I must deal with this. But today I'm going to restrict only to the medical management of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. That is the eutrotonics, basically. So I'll be talking about different eutrotonics for PPH, how to choose them, what are the challenges with each one of them, and how they compare with each other. And I'll be quoting the WHO in my talk. All of us know that the four T's for PPH. Number one is tone, the most important one, inability of the uterus to contract is the cause of postpartum hemorrhage. Second one is trauma, injury to birth canal, which includes rupture of the uterus as well, or it can be uterine inversion, lacerations, vaginal, cervical. Thrombin, coagulopathies, failure in clotting could be due to many reasons in obstetrics, including abruptio placenta or severe postpartum itself can perpetuate by giving rise to consumptive coagulopathy. And finally, the tissue that is retention of placenta and clots and abdominal uh, abnormal placenta, all this can give rise to secondary PPH. So it's in that direction as I have put. But today, as I said, I'll talk only about atonic PPH and how to use eutrotonics. As I just now said, atonic PPH is the most common cause of PPH, almost 70% more than two thirds of the cause is atonic PPH. So we should be very well versed with what eutrotonics to be used, how they should be used. Then comes trauma, 20%, and then the tissue, 10%, and thrombin is only 1%, usually towards the end, when they get into DIC. WHO has clearly talked about active management of third stage of labor. Again, I tell undergraduate students, third stage of labor, there are three steps in the active management. And if they don't know that, then they should be failed three times. As you can see the recommendations here, but I'm going to highlight that. Number one is eutrotonic immediately after delivery. Now, this is a very, what I call the qualitative word immediately after delivery. Usually we say at the time of delivery of anterior shoulder of the baby, because that's the time the cervix is nicely dilated. And if you give at that time, cervix won't contract that easily. Suppose you miss that timing, you can give within one minute of the delivery of the baby. So now that anterior shoulder of the baby, it was actually once happened the one of the enthusiastic interns was holding that time it was ergometric not oxytocin he just gave it to the anterior shoulder of the baby itself i mean he had heard some anterior shoulder you don't give it to the anterior shoulder of the baby the timing is and at the time of delivery of the anterior shoulder of the baby but you must give it to the mother right and of course uh, if you miss that within one minute but here the word used by who is Eutrotonic immediately after delivery. Controlled cord traction. Now, controlled cord traction is very, very important 
because otherwise you will cause inversion of the uterus, which is also one of the causes of postpartum hemorrhage. So how do you control? You control the fundus like that backwards and you pull the cord. So that is controlled cord traction. Number three is massaging of the uterus. See what is written in the bracket. Not needed if uterotonic is given. Now you must be wondering what uterotonic should be given. So that's where the whole talk is uh, hinged upon and I'll be clarifying all that. What WHO says says it recommends the use of an effective uterotonic. You ask me which uterotonic? WHO says effective uterotonic. Again, a political sort of statement or a word, qualitative statement. For the prevention of PPH during the third stage of labor for all births. To effectively prevent PPH, only one uterotonic should be used to prevent not to treat, underline the word. Only one uterotonic. Don't use multiple uterotonics because remember, placenta is not yet delivered. If you give multiple uterotonics, then there are chances that the placenta will be locked up inside the uterus. So single, only one. I have highlighted the words. Uterotonics to be used. Now I give you the choices. Could be oxytocin. Could be carbitocin. Could be mesoprostol. Also, ergometrin slash methyl ergometrin, any one of them, oxytocin and ergometrin fixed dose combination, syntometrin, what we used to get uh, in the market. So, any one of them can be used actually, but the most popular one has been oxytocin 10 units IM. Now, be clear about it. 10 units IM, not IV. Why? If you give a loading dose of 10 units IV, there can be sudden hypotension that can occur. Usually, there is a confusion, especially amongst the anesthetist. When we do cesarean section, when we ask them to give 10 units of oxytocin, they push that 10 units of oxytocin in the drip. They are not somehow probably understood or we have not told them very clearly. If you give it into the drip, what happens? The drip will go slowly over a period of time. Usually it takes around three to four hours and that is not enough. We want an uterotonic which would act immediately to make the uterus contract so that the placenta gets separated and then the placental delivery becomes easy. So you have to request whoever is giving, whether it is anesthetist or a nurse or your assistant, intern, PG, whoever it is, that 10 units of oxytocin should be given intramuscular to the mother, not to the baby, to the mother, either at the time of delivery of the anterior shoulder of the baby or within one minute of delivery of the baby. It's always within the delivery of the baby and not the placenta because we are trying to prevent postpartum hemorrhage here. We are not treating the postpartum hemorrhage here. Please make this distinction very, very clear. So earlier, we used to give actually ergometrin, and that was very difficult, which had to be given intravenously, finding a vein and giving and all this. So much of commotion used to be there in the labor room uh, because at the time of delivery of the anterior shoulder, the nurse is not ready, the vein is not available, this and that. So oxytocin is so simple, you can give just intramuscular. So that is the advantage of that. And it will act immediately when you give intramuscular. And then you can con continue with your controlled cord traction. After that, if you feel that there is some amount of bleeding still, you can add now 10 to 20 units of oxytocin to the drip. That is different. That is for the sustained contraction of the uterus after the delivery of placenta. I hope I'm very clear. So the first 10 units is given intramuscularly. That is a part of the active management of the third stage of labor, which is given intramuscularly. What you give after the delivery of placenta to keep the uterus sustained, to maintain the sustained contraction, you may add 
10 to 20 units. So that's why I always teach 10 units as IM, 20 units as IV. 20 units, you give it in the IV trip, which will go over a period of time. I hope all these things are very, very clear. We have to be very clear about all these things. That's why I'm keeping on harping the same thing again and again. We should be very, very clear. Clarity is power. That's what I tell my PGs all the time. If there is something called power, then it is clarity. Now, let's see WHO, what it says. The use of oxytocin, 10 units, IM or IV, IV, of course, not to be given fast, is recommended for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage for all births. Recommended. Clear. No confusion. No doubt. The use of carbitocin, 100 microgram IM or IV, is recommended for the prevention of PPH for all births till now. It sounds the same sentence as above, but look here. In contexts where its cost is comparable to other effective eutrotonics. So what's the recommendation, category of recommendation? Context-specific recommendation. Because the cost is a factor. now. The use of mesoprostol, either 400 micrograms or 600 micrograms per oral, is recommended for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage for all births. Again, the category is just recommended. So the color combination, you can make out what is clearly recommended and what is context-specific recommendation. How about ergometrin or methyl ergometrin, 200 micrograms IM or IV, is recommended for prevention of PPH in contexts where hypertensive disorders can be safely excluded prior to its use. Again, it is context specific. What is the context now? It's not the cost. With respect to carbitocin, it was the cost was the context. Here, the context is hypertensive disorder. You have to rule out hypertensive. It is contraindicated, relatively contraindicated. Uh, I would say even absolutely contraindicated because it can throw a fit. But the thing is, please always remember, you cannot say, I didn't allow the mother to die of eclampsia, but I allowed her to die of postpartum hemorrhage. That cannot be there. So you have to be very, very live there, alive there, and decide what is more grave. Suppose there is a lot of PPH and saving the life becomes more important. You can give argumentation. That's why I use the word relative contraindication. But straight away, you don't give it in a case of hypertensive disorder. You manage with other things. Suppose in spite of that, PPH is going on, then of course, you cannot allow her to die of postpartum hemorrhage. The use of fixed dose combination of oxytocin and ergometrin, I told you that symptometrin, is recommended for the prevention of PPH in context, again here, where hypertensive disorder can be safely excluded prior to its use. Why? because ergometrin is there. So though oxytocin is there, but there is a combination of that with ergometrin. When, whenever ergometrin is there, it is contraindicated because uh, it will cause permanent contractions, not only of the uterus, but it will also cause the vasospasm. And vasospasm is not good for a hypertensive lady. She will have sudden hypertension and she can throw a fit. That can be hemorrhage in the brain. Finally, Injectable prostaglandins, that is carboprost and sulfrostone, are not recommended for the prevention of PPH. Now, here is the situation where everybody will get confused. This carboprost can be a life-saving drug. Let me tell very clearly. Can be a life-saving drug in so-called True postpartum hemorrhage. See, there is something like people say true postpartum hemorrhage and uh, the postpartum hemorrhage that occurs during the third stage of labor also. See, the definition of postpartum hemorrhage simply means postpartum. Partum means who? Partum is always with reference to the baby. 
after the delivery of the baby, if the bleeding occurs, that's called postpartum hemorrhage. Now, you should remember, after the delivery of the baby, there is something called third stage of labor, isn't it? Third stage of labor is the delivery of the placenta. After that, also there can be bleeding. So postpartum hemorrhage occurs during third stage of labor and after third stage of labor also. Now, some people call the bleeding that is occurring after the third stage of labor, that means after the delivery of placenta, as true postpartum hemorrhage. Now, in that situation, where placenta has already been delivered, carboprost is very, very useful and life-saving. But clearly see here what WHO has said, carboprost is not recommended for prevention of PPH. Prevention of PPH, you always give uterotonics before the delivery of placenta. So if you give carboprost before the delivery of placenta, it will cause severe contractions and there will be incarcerated placenta. Placenta will be locked up inside the uterus. That's why, let me tell you very clearly for the last time that carboprost is not recommended for prevention, but for treatment of true postpartum hemorrhage, carboprost can be used. In fact, it is used. Now I come to the choice. WHO, in the settings where multiple uterotonic options are available, what to do? This is the confusion. Oxytocin is there, misoprostol is there, carboprost is there. Everything is there on the tray or on the trolley. When options are available, oxytocin 10 units, IM or IV is recommended uterotonic agent for the prevention of PPH for all births. Clear, very, very clear. Oxytocin 10 units, I am or IV. I am prefer, I prefer I am. Okay. So IV because you cannot give fast and it has to be given in a trip. So I am is better. In settings where oxytocin is not available or its quality not guaranteed because oxytocin requires a lot of cold chain, this and that, the use of other injectable uterotonics in bracket, carbitocin, ergometrin slash methyl ergometrin or oxytocin and ergometrin fixed dose combination bracket close or oral mesoprostol is recommended for the prevention of PPH. Nowhere you can see carboprost. Is it clear? So that is recommended. In settings where skilled health professionals are not present, only birth attendant, IA, nurse or whatever it is, to administer injectable uterotonics, the administration of mesoprostol 600 micrograms or 600, 400 or 600 micrograms per oral by community health worker or lay health worker is recommended for the prevention of PPH. Now it is for the prevention of PPH oral, per oral we are giving. That is recommended where you think that the birth attendant is not good enough to give a injection, whether IM or IV. I think it's very, very clear. Now, what are the challenges with uterotonics? We have got so many uterotonics. Let's look at the challenges. Oxytocin, it needs for appropriate training to clinical staff. Of course, we have to give it injection, IV or IM. Regular patient monitoring and shorter half-life. That's exactly why it is a very good agent for inducing as well as not inducing, sorry, for augmentation of labor. Because the moment you stop oxytocin drip, the action is gone within a few minutes. That's why, that is because of its shorter half-life. Need for other uterotonic agents. See, oxytocin is very good for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. It will give good uterine contractions to make sure that the placenta is separated. But as I told you earlier, if you remember, that one dose of oxytocin is not good enough to keep the sustained uterus, uterine contraction. That's why after the delivery of placenta, I told you, add 10 to 20 units in the drip. So that's what it says again. It needs other uterotonic agents sometimes because of its shorter half-life. That is the difficulty. What about oral mesoprostol? Higher risk of severe PPH, uh, increased need of additional uh, uterotonic, greater incidence of nausea, vomiting, 
diarrhea and shivering. So because all prostaglandins have got this problem, um, you may get confused with the first sentence. Higher risk for severe PPH means oral mesoprostal when you give, it adds again, but it has to pass through the uh, first pass mechanism and all those things. That's why it will also cause not only nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. It may not give that kind of a good contraction that is required after the delivery of the baby. Syntometrin, it's a combination of oxytocin and ergometrin, significantly increase the risk of elevated BP, nausea and vomiting. That's why whenever there is hypertension, it is not to be used. Methyl ergometrin, though very, very good uh, utrotonic, but it is significantly increased nausea vomiting as well as BP. So they are not to be given. Now we have this heat stable carbitocin. Let us see the need for refrigeration. Oxytocin and ergot alkaloid should be kept in refrigerator to avoid degradation. Both, right? So heat stable formulation of oxytocin is currently not available. Previous formulations of carbitocin should be stored between two to eight degree. That was the previous, uh, you know, formulation. Resource poor countries do not always have cold chain transport and storage capabilities. Whereas the current carbitocin is stable at room temperature, that's very important, has half life of shelf life of 24 months at 30 degree and 75% humidity. Very good for a place like Manipal, where there's a lot of humidity. Avoids need for cold chain storage and logistics and is provided in a vial. That is always the problem with oxytocin. How much to dilute, how much to do this, that, and all so much of calculations. That calculation is not necessary because it is provided in one well. You just cut the vial and take it and give it. That's the beauty of this particular drug. Carbitocin is available in room temperature, stable formulation, and convenient vial presentation. Next generation drug, oxytocin and carbitocin. If you see can here, carbitocin was created by making several modifications to oxytocin structure. It prolongs the half-life, reduces the enzymatic degradation. It is synthetic, long-acting analog of oxytocin, actually. And the indication is prevention of PPH due to uterine attorney. Administration is that single vial of 100 microgram in one ml solution for injection, readily available. Mechanism of action, if you look at here, receptor binding triggers activation of phospholipase C and the generation of the second messengers, IP3 and diacyl glycosyrol. IP3 induces release of free calcium from the intracellular stores. After all, you need that. Binding of calcium to calmodulin stimulates uterine smooth muscle contractions by activation of myosin light chain kinase. So single IV dose of carbitocin, 100 microgram administered after the delivery of baby is sufficient to maintain adequate uterine contraction, prevention of uterine atony, and excessive bleeding with efficacy comparable to hours of oxytocin infusion. I hope everything makes sense now. I told you oxytocin IM is very good because it causes contraction, makes the placenta separate and all that, but it has no sustained action. For sustained action, you have to give oxytocin in a drip or 10 to 20 units for a period of time. Whereas carbitocin, it will not only do that good job, which oxytocin can do, it is heat stable and it is just one injection comes in the ready-made vial. And not only that, it has got a good sustained action as well. What are the benefits of carbitocin versus oxytocin? It is reduced need for additional uterotonic agent, longer half-life, similar efficacy, similar onset of action, good tolerability. So the, here is the comparison. As you can see here, onset of action of carbitocin is 1.2 minutes if it is given IV, 2.3 minutes if it is given IM. Comparable, of course, as far as the action, uh, onset of action, but the duration, if you look at here, 60 minutes after IV, 119 good minutes, 120, you can make it double. I don't know why they have made it as one less. Whereas, as you can see, oxytocin, hardly 30 minutes. Half-life is 40 minutes of carbitocin, whereas three to five minutes of oxytocin. So a single injection achieves uterine activity within two minutes 
and last for one hour can increase the rate and force of spontaneous uterine contractions as well. Another benefit, if you can see, our carbitocin is 24, 24 fold less potent than oxytocin at vasopressin B2 receptor, reducing the risk of hyponatremia. This is an added advantage. So oxytocin displays high structural similarity to vasopressin, a hormone involved in regulation of water reabsorption. So water retention in the body can lead to disturbances in sodium levels. Oxytocin has antidiuretic effect and IV infusion may cause water intoxication and acute form of hyponatremia. So water intoxication has been reported in women treated with oxytocin for PPH induction or augmentation of labor and abortion. First of all, it has to be, when you give it for a long time, you are giving it with a vehicle that is either rigor lactate or sometimes even dextrose people give, but that itself can retain the water, which is not there with carbitocin. That's an added advantage. So to date, no case of hyponatremia has been reported with carbitocin. So champion trial of the WHO told that Carbitocin hemorrhage prevention, the largest clinical trial in the prevention of PPH. Trial conducted by the WHO itself, Department of Reproductive Health and Research. Study design, non-inferiority, double-blind, randomized trial. That's so good. Objective was to compare the effectiveness and safety of investigational heat-stable carbitocin to oxytocin in the prevention of PPH after vaginal birth. Patients enrolled more than 30,000 women across 10 countries, including India. Primary outcomes, the portion of the women with blood loss of at least 500 ml or the use of additional eutrotonic agents. 500 ml is our standard postpartum de uh, hemorrhage definition. The proportion of women with blood loss of 1000 ml. Carbitocin is non-inferior to oxytocin. Of course, you know, it's a fantastic terminology, non-inferior. They didn't say it is superior, but they said it is non-inferior to oxytocin. Single dose carbitocin versus oxytocin infusion. Hemodynamic effects of oxytocin and carbitocin were compared and their efficacy was assessed in terms of blood loss, additional uterotonic needed in cesarean session. Always the comparisons are like that only. Blood loss and additional uterotonic agent. Prospective case control study. What we saw was our carbitocin group received a bolus of 100 IV at delivery, oxytocin group, also received that in saline solution at delivery. As you can see here, it is given 150 ml at least per hour. It's not bolus, it's not given fast. Early hemodynamic effects were assessed as impact on BP, need for additional uterotonic agents, blood loss, drop in hemoglobin. Additionally, BP, uterine tone and uterine position were monitored two hours, 12 hours, 24 hours after delivery. Let's see the result. Carbitocin and oxytocin have a hypotensive effect, of course, whereas women treated with oxytocin showed greater reduction in blood pressure. Significantly more women treated with oxytocin needed additional uterotonic agents compared to those who treated with carbitocin, obviously because it has got a shorter half-life. Patients treated with carbitocin showed better uterine contractility at two hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, with statistically significant difference. That is the advantage of carbitocin. It not only acts like oxytocin in prevention of postpartum hemorrhage, after that, it will have a sustained action. So a single injection of carbitocin was found to be more effective than a continuous infusion of oxytocin in prevention of PPH. So promising agent carbitocin, efficacy of carbitocin was checked against Conventional eutrotonic agents for the prevention of PPH, carbitocin was compared with oxytocin, symptomatrin, or placebo when given IM after normal vaginal delivery as well as cesarean delivery. Carbitocin is effective compared to other conventional eutrotonic agents. Statistically significant reduction in need for therapeutic eutrotonics compared to oxytocin in cesarean deliveries. Reduced need for uterine massage compared to those treated with oxytocin after vaginal or cesarean delivery lower risk for PPH and lower blood loss compared to those treated with symptometry. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, understood everything very clearly. This is a very, very important topic because this is going to save the lives of the mothers. 
So thank you very much. Tomorrow, no class because Dr. Pratap is giving a talk uh, in Manipal and I want to also attend that if possible, if it's online. I think it's not online, it is uh, an offline uh, affair. Uh, that's why I won't uh, be taking any class tomorrow. Thank you very much.